it's a pleasure to welcome Michelle uh, Wilson André. She's, she studied life science, then she specialized to become a science and health uh, communication expert. She is now the head of communications at Euricare, one of the most dynamic life science startup studio in Europe. Euricare uh, was launched uh, in July 2021 in Brussels and Paris, backed by 60 million euros from private investors. Nice to have you, Michelle. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks, Ari. Nice to be chatting with you today. Thank you for, for being my guest. It's a real pleasure to have you. And if you allow me, uh, this interview will be in two, two parts. We will a little bit talk about yourself and your path from science to communication and then your role as a head of comms uh, at uh, Eureka. Do you agree? Great. Perfect. Great. So let's start with the uh, young Michelle uh, when she freshly graduated from high school uh, and she wanted, she wanted to enter university. What was your plan at that moment? So I guess at that moment, I was really interested in animal behavior and specifically marine biology. And so I ended up choosing uh, a university in Canada, Dalhousie University, that's one of the few to have a marine biology program. Mm. So I dreamt of doing that when I was in high school. <laughs> so you, I, I read that um, on your profile that you, you, you actually uh, um, follow uh, dolphin or, or whales, right? right? Uh, on, on I did, yeah. Wow. And it's actually, um, it's one of the experiences that sort of brought me to my interest in science communication. So as, as part of that program, um, there was a period where we got to track whales for about 30 days, one month. Mm. And um, we were in the Bay of Fundy off the east coast of Canada. And we were tracking the humpback whales, but they also have another species of whale called the right whale, which was very endangered and it still is right now. But at the time, there were about only 350 individuals of those whales. Um, and the reason why their numbers were so low is because their migration routes intersected directly with shipping lanes, big shipping lanes, you know, transporting oil carriers, all of that. And um, for the past probably two decades, the scientific community had been advocating to have those shipping lanes change so that it would be out of the migratory routes of the whales. And it was very difficult to do. And it wasn't until um, they actually engaged an activist organization and a professional communications agency to start lobbying the government and doing a lot of public awareness around it, they actually were able to get the policy changed that had the shipping lanes moved by just two kilometers. Mm -hmm. And that shift of two kilometers reduced the number of whale impacts by 80%. Wow. So it was then that I sort of realized, you know, um, I think research is always important, but sometimes we have a lot of research in a certain area and it's time to take action and convince policymakers to take action, start new companies, really put that research into action. And I think sometimes communications can be a great vehicle for that. It's amazing because uh, in the size of the ocean, two kilometers is nothing, you know? Exactly. And this outcome has been possible with scientific research saying just, just move Two kilometers and 80% yeah. of, of the whales are impacting the, 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 the big ship. This is amazing. And uh, uh, so that was it the, the, the I think uh, the, the moment or the, the, the event that make you realize that communicating about science was something important? Exactly. Yeah, that's where I really started thinking about it. And I also realized that a lot of what I enjoyed um, about research was not necessarily sitting in the lab, you know, doing the experiment or being out there on a boat, watching seabirds for five hours, but it was actually talking about it at the end and communicating the results. Yeah, I totally understand. <laughs> so, um, uh, so then you, 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 you decided to, 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 to get uh, to, to get the skills, right? Uh, and you, you, you enter a tool, you get two master degree, could you talk, talk about these two masters, if you want science communication and the yeah. second one in public health policy and, and management, right? 
Yeah, exactly. So um, when I did my master's in science communication, I wanted to sort of learn about the broader field. It wasn't something at the time that a lot of people, uh, especially in Canada, weren't really talking about. The program that I did was at uh, the Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona. And I think now it's been running for about 30 years. So it was one of the first programs to establish itself. And I really like this idea of learning about all sorts of different science communications. So what you might do within a museum, what you might do within uh, public sector organizations, working for a hospital or for a ministry, or then you know perhaps um, the more media approach, there were quite a few journalists in my class that wanted to become more specialized on science and health topics. And there were also a lot of researchers in my course that wanted to get more training on the media side of things, writing, um, you know, really how to synthesize complex information and make it relatable and understandable. Great. And then, sorry. No, 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 because it's very interesting to see how then um, you implemented all, all of these skills in, in, your experience, in your experience. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, please go, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I got you. Gotcha. Yes, and then the, the other master's is an executive master's that I did here in Paris at Sciences Po. Um, and I actually just finished it last year, so it's quite, it's quite recent. I took a, uh, about a 10-year break from school before doing that. But it was really, um, I guess, working in various research institutes uh, in communications, I became really interested in this link between research and our healthcare system and how we move research from the healthcare system, um, or sorry, from the, from the research sector to our healthcare systems. And, um, you know, in many cases, I, I got the chance to work on some public health campaigns, mm -hmm. uh, working very closely with uh, the Ministry of Health in Canada. And I really was able to see sort of the full step of the process, working closely with the researchers, developing something, having new clinical guidelines be implemented at the hospitals we were working with, and then letting the public know about this new standard of care and having patients be able to advocate for their, for their own health and their own quality of care. Uh, did you notice that there is a cultural difference concerning you know, the public health communication, for instance, in France compared to, uh, let's say, UK or Northern America? Uh, I think the public health communication in Northern America or UK is more, is more fun, more uh, user-centered you know, than in, in France, which is very formal, very scientific-based, you know, even a little bit boring sometimes. So, <laughs> because this is some... This is the kind of feedback uh, I have from patients who say, you know, this, this, this institutional communication are, are cold or are too much complicated for us. Did you notice this kind of difference, this cultural difference between the approach of the communication? Yeah, I have noticed a little bit. I guess there's a word um, that I was used to using in Canada that we call outreach. Mm -hmm. And um, there isn't really a translation for it in French. Like I, I tried to translate it diffusion, transfusion, and <laughs> it doesn't really work. Um, but I guess for me, even just using that word, there's sort of an, an approach that really intends to bring people in. Mm -hmm. And because of that, um, I think that, yeah, maybe in some cases, um, you know, hospitals uh, in Canada, for example, might also have a private foundation. So they might have a little bit more budget as well for some of these sort of outreach initiatives where they're doing big, big public health campaigns and really doing things that are meant to appeal to the general public as opposed to just, you know, putting up the statistics like we might see from Communique de Presse, from uh, the HIS and NSM, things like that. I think. It, it could be a question of resources as well in some cases. Okay, um, fine, great, great, great. So um, I believe that you can you can bring this kind of uh, cultural, uh, user centered way of communication to to the to the French um, spoken uh, uh, organization. I totally believe that. Um, so um, can I say now? So you master both. Uh, pop science communication for a large audience and at the same time evidence-based uh, communication for expert audience yeah i would think kind so. of dual uh, dual way of working right 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think, um, you know, we, we used to have the saying that we would use a lot at, at one of the research institutes I, I worked at, but behind every, every data point is a real person. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that even when um, we do really want to use a lot of solid facts and, you know, evidence base in our communications, there's a way to make it both relatable and accessible, but still have the hard facts there. Mm -hmm. So uh, just could you remind us the, 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 the famous organization you worked uh, for uh, this past year? Because I, I noticed that you have a, a great, uh, you joined great organizations. So uh, maybe yeah. you can talk about a little bit about the organization. And if you have some anecdotes, I would be delighted to hear about that. Sure, I guess um, one of my first jobs after I, I left Spain and went back to Canada was at the Discovery Channel. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was very media focused and, and sort of science focused. Um, well, increasingly less science focused now, but at the time. And I guess one of the things that I learned there, um, I had to do a lot of public relations and media relations. So a lot of um, press releases and trying to get journalists uh, interested in some of the scientific programming that we showcased. And I guess one thing that can be of interest to someone that might be new to the communications field is sort of putting yourself in the shoes of the person who's receiving your information. And especially when you're doing media relations, putting yourself in the shoes of the journalist. And I remember I was sending out press releases to journalists working in radio because I wanted them to talk about uh, one of the shows that we were featuring a documentary on the radio and timing in radio, you know, every single minute is filled and I was trying to get my work done in advance and I think I was sending them the press releases like three weeks in advance. And to them, it didn't make any sense because they're, they're not on that kind of time frame. They're on like what's happening in the next 24, 48 hours. So by the time, by the time the show was rolling around, they had completely forgotten about my press release. And <laughs> yes, this is something funny because uh, I wrote some, uh, pub, um, some uh, peers some years ago, you know, when I was a little bit younger. And when I, one of the mentor told me the worst kind of, uh, press release you can you can write for a company says you know the, the kind of we are delighted to announce you that the vice pre, the new vice president of this of that is mr or, or mrs this and you send it to journalists expecting that they will you know they will catch catch the they will be news, yeah. they don't care, you know <laughs> so say something that they can they can excite them and uh, you know uh, and and this is was really something uh, uh, I, I really appreciate to it during this talk you also worked for the Institut du Cerveau, very, uh, very prestigious, and CNRS also, and Selectis, a very famous stem cell company in France. Um, how was your experience during, during the, let's say, this French uh, organization and, and startup for Selectis? Yeah, um, it was great, like working within uh, the public research system in France uh, was wonderful because I definitely got to work with a lot of really talented uh, researchers at l'Institut du Cerveau. My job was a little bit different because I was a project manager for international relations. So part of my job was sort of working on the international programming that we had. And another part of my job was also trying to increase the visibility of the Institute and sort of strengthen our um, international communications. Um, I think uh, one of the, yeah, one of the highlights I would really say is the talent of, of the researchers in France, and I definitely experienced the same thing at the CNRS. Um, in some cases, and I have to say especially at the CNRS, um, the level of sort of bureaucracy, and because it's a very large organization, was sometimes I find a bit impeding mm. um, because it seemed to really, you know, sort of stretch the time of researchers having to do a lot of these administrative processes and not necessarily having the support organized in the right way around that. And I think also when it comes to communications, it's also an area where it could be stronger on the international side because there's definitely a lot to showcase. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, how did you um, join Eureka? What was the, uh, the let's say the event or the story, how, how did you connect with the team and, and you joined this, this amazing new adventure? 
Yeah, well, to be honest, I was really lucky because um, I had a former colleague that I knew at the Institut du Sapovo that also works for Your Care Now. Uh, she works on the non-dilutive funding side, so she helps oh, okay. some of our startup companies find uh, public funding. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she's the one that told me about it. And when I heard um, just about the project, I found it really interesting because um, it seemed like the kind of place where I could have sort of one foot in the private sector biotech world and another foot still very close to uh, the researchers and, and public sector. So that was something that I found really exciting. So that so this it was a, um, a friends or colleague who, who tell you that we, there is a great project that is that is under Cook, you know, under the Uber yeah. and. The, come and join us uh, something like that right yeah and i think at the same time too um they're going through quite a bit of growth very quickly and um it was the first time that they sort of decided that they they needed to place more of a focus on communication so we started talking about that and it turned out to be a good fit perfect perfect so um could you talk about now about uh, your role at eureka and what does it mean to be head of communications uh what are your responsibilities? Yeah, absolutely. So just for, uh, I guess, people that don't know, so Your Care is an investment company that focuses on both early stage and later stage investment in biotech companies that are mainly focused on synthetic biology uh, and also in the microbiome space. And uh, for the time being, it's focused on Europe and the larger definition of Europe, so UK and Israel included in that as well. Um, for now, so we, um, we're actually just getting started on a more robust communication strategy and building on, on what's sort of been put in place so far. One of the kind of challenges, I guess, is not just focusing on your care, but about the whole ecosystem that the company is trying to build through uh, the later stage biotech companies that it's already invested in and some early stage projects that it will bring through its specialized biotech studio. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is really be able to showcase all the amazing work that each of these companies is doing individually, but also show the impact that it's having collectively uh, in Europe and internationally. Great. So, um... Operationally, you need to talk to, to the academic world, to, let's say, to, to the investors, uh, to big pharmaceutical company, um, even to the large audience, because uh, it's very important what you do, what you are cooking inside Eureka as a startup for what, what these startups uh, will deliver to the, to the society in terms of outcomes. So you certainly have also a, a, a large audience communication alongside the other lines. Uh, what is your uh, techniques and methods, uh, you know, for for communication? Because more practically, because maybe scientists will join would like to understand how you how you do, you know, your job. Yeah. I think uh, well, one of the important things is to plan, and I think the best thing to do is usually to try to put a sort of communication strategy in place for you know, the next six months or, or a year if someone has the time to do that. And when you're doing that, I think um, it's important to really identify what the vision of the company is and how you want to get that across to whatever your audiences are. And sometimes I think um, companies or young projects are not even sure who their audiences are. So that's another part of, um, part of seeing, you know, really who you're speaking to and what information is going to be important to them. So in a typical communication strategy, I would probably have a bit of an assessment of, you know, what's going on so far, what kind of communications are you doing on a daily, monthly, yearly basis? Are you running a special event every year? Are you sending out a newsletter? Do you have a website? Do you have social media? Taking a look at what's happening and then, you know, based on your resources, determining, 
what's worth kind of investing more in, investing more time? Where are you getting more traction? You know, do you get interesting emails from investors when you're posting things on social media? Or, you know, is it more when you're doing interviews with someone like yourself or a journalist? Figuring out what gets you visibility and the right kind of visibility is really important. So I would start with a sort of audit of, okay, what am I doing? What's working? What's not working? Um, sometimes a basic SWOT analysis, analysis can be useful as well, um, just to help consider, you know, do we need to put a crisis communication strategy in place in case, you know, one day uh, we have a data breach for this project, or just making sure that you can be proactive on, on certain issues, and also, you know, not just on the negative side, but to be able to seize special opportunities, like if the CEO of your company is invited to a big conference, what else can you sort of work around that to you know, showcase what you guys are doing. Um, so a bit of an analysis part. And then the next part is just super practical. And it's listing out all the different events and, and channels that you'll, that you'll want to be focusing on throughout the year and figuring out who's responsible for it and how you're going to carry it out. So, um, of course, you are, you are going to, to, to use all the available digital tools you have under your hands right now. We have now under our hands, uh, video, uh, writing articles, etc. Uh, I just wanted to, to talk with you about, you know, maybe a side subject, you know, maybe you have heard about the, the DNVB phenomenon this past year, the digital native vertical brands, you know, this, uh, this new brands in, that have one product, one verticals, and, you know, they are very, um, um, the, we have fantastic brands these past 10 years, such as Feed in France or, or Asphalt or many others who are now unicorns. And they have a very particular strategy, you know, because they took the communication, but with the marketing mindset, you know, um, with the strong branding, you know, they, they, they push the brand inside the mind of the of their target customers. And then with, the, with inbound marketing, you know, they pull uh, these, these people uh, and convert them as a client and transform them into fan and evangelists. And, and do you think that this kind of strategy is something interesting uh, to, to bring for into, in, in, into the deep tech world or, or maybe not? What is your thought about that? Yeah, I mean, I do think it's interesting. It's probably an area where I have a little bit less expertise on the pure marketing side of things, but I do think it's important to look to some of these examples, even if you know, the market that they're operating in seems totally different mm -hmm. from what someone in biotech might be doing. I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned. Um, one of the, you know, uh, he's a big marketing guy, Simon Sinek, uh, who talks a lot about his marketing strategy. And, you know, I think he's, he's advised tens of companies from Coca-Cola to Pharma. And this notion of, of starting with why. Um, I think that's something that also really speaks to today's generation to have this purpose. And when you couple that with the social media tools that we have today, I think it can definitely be extremely powerful. So you have some good uh, opinion about this strategy. You're not some. You're not completely, you know, uh, um, blocked about that because uh, I talked with some other, you know, communication and marketing experts and said they told me abandon completely to try the strategy with scientists and engineers because they don't get it so you will waste your time but you believe it i believe in it so maybe we can uh make it work with scientists and because the goal of that is to starify you know the science yeah i think there are always there are always lessons to be learned mm. from many different domains and if we kind of stay in our field you know as i said before it's it's definitely not my area of extra of expertise i'm not like an avid tiktok or instagram user <laughs> but i think you have to keep your eyes out for what's going on and and what you know today and tomorrow's generations are doing otherwise we'll all just become dinosaurs <laughs> <laughs> great absolutely dinosaurs yes yes <laughs> So it was a real pleasure to have you. Maybe we can conclude um, uh, by saying uh, some words. Maybe if you want to say some words to to the side directly to scientists and engineers from the academic world, and if you have some, I don't know, good books or article or podcast, anything that inspire you, not necessarily in science, but anything you want to recommend us, we would be delighted to hear about that. 
<laughs> sure. Um, well, first of all, I mean, I think I, I feel really grateful to be living at this time with all of the amazing scientific progress that we've made and that's still continuing to move forward. I mean, sometimes, um, you know, at, at work, at your care, when we're talking about certain subjects like DNA storage, you know, like to store information on you know, amino acids, it's just kind of crazy. And it's stuff that- Sorry, Just to, to the audience, yeah. that know, DNA storage is fantastic because <laughs> with the quantum computing, all the crypto yeah. will be broken. Yeah. The, only, the only way to, to ensure that the crypto uh, money, the cryptocurrency will be, will sustain is to, to, to transfer the data into DNA. So I, I, I start to say that. <laughs> Well, yeah, and it, and it sounds so uh, science fiction, um, but, you know, it's it's real now. And I'm just so uh, admirative of the researchers that, you know, have so much perseverance to keep on working on these things, because I know that, you know, sometimes research can be a very unglamorous job. There can be many failures. It can get boring. I think there are also problems with the way that we... Um, I can't think of the word in English, but like valorise mm -hmm. uh, researchers. And I don't even just mean in terms of pay, which I think in France especially is a problem. And, you know, a lot of French researchers, great ones leave to go, you know, make a better living somewhere else. Um, but also in how we can make it more um, fulfilling. And I think sometimes the hierarchy structures that are very prevalent in academia can really damage young researchers that actually are super motivated to, to do what they're doing. So I would just say to, to not give up um, because it's really fantastic and it's such an amazing societal contribution. Um, one book that might be inspirational and um, it might not be something that people would typically think of, but I recently read the biography of Leonardo da Vinci mm. by Walter Isaacson. It's the same biographer that did the Steve Jobs uh, biography. He's, he's a very good biographer. Oh, okay. And it's interesting because I didn't know much about da Vinci, honestly, before I read this book. And he didn't have the kind of like genius brain power that someone like Einstein had, you know, like he made mistakes in math. He had no formal engineering or really any formal academic training. He was fully, fully self-taught. And the thing that really kept him going, um, both in, in his painting and artistic work, but also in, you know, some of the amazing engineering and anatomical work that he did for that time was his curiosity. And, uh, you know, at one point there, he discusses one of the notebooks that they found and, you know, he's writing all of these very detailed, you know, he's working on his war machines at the time. And then there was a little note that said, describe the tongue of a woodpecker. And you know, the woodpecker is the bird that, <laughs> and you just, it just kind of makes you imagine this kind of person always asking himself questions, always curious about the world around him. And I think that's something that we should all remember. I will ask you the, the reference uh, offline and, and I will share it uh, in the blog post. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, it was a real pleasure to have you today. And uh, Thank you for what you do. It's very important for the community, for the scientific community, for the entrepreneurial community. So thank you very much for, for being my guest today and hope to, to meet you in person and discuss about science and tech uh, in person and in, in, in the near future. Thank you very much. Bye, Zari. It was such a pleasure.